introduction. Uh, thank you for organizing this event. Uh, okay, so let's start this way. Uh, first of all, happy Friday. Thank you for deciding to spend more or less the next 60 minutes together with me talking about uh, minimizing the risk of Teams autonomy in the cloud. I believe this is something that each of us face uh, during our projects. Today we have uh, 21st of January, and this is kind of a special day. Not only because you have me presenting uh, this short, uh, short deck, but in Poland, we celebrate the same as in Ukraine, you celebrate at 28th of October, and in Bulgaria, it is 26th of June. So we have grand, uh, Grandmother's Day today. So if any grandmas are there, uh, all good for you. But, you know, every day we have like global day of something yeah and in poland i believe this is it was it was a global day so yesterday 20th of january if i'm calculating properly it was a global day of the dish we called bigos uh who knows that dish who has ever tried this dish you can uh vote using this annotate option in zoom so you can click view options annotate and in the next slide, you will have the opportunity to uh, put a stamp on the screen. So the question is, have you ever eat a bigos and you know what it is? Short time for you, 30 seconds. I see someone is not eating bread at all. That's healthy, <laughs> especially the, the, let's say, white one. Okay, and by the way, how do we uh, pronounce it? How do we uh, name this dish in Ukraine? That's the bigos as well, or? Oh, okay. Yes, okay, thank you. Thank you for voting. Let me clear the screen. Um, bank, clear all drawings. Okay, and let's proceed. That's of course, because if you want to prepare one to celebrate uh, like yesterday, there is actually one, one rule. You can use cabbage, pork, sausages, and mushroom, but generally speaking, there are totally no rules how to, how to prepare that. And you know, whenever there are no rules, Everyone can cook it however he wants, and it can bring to a total mess. So bigos is a kind of synonym of mess. In Poland, you can say ale bigos, what means what a mess, yeah? So, and today our presentation, uh, during my presentation, I will try to convince you that it is possible using proper tools to not end up having bigos in your Azure environment. Uh, so no mess, that's possible. We, I will show you how to achieve that. Let me just clear the drawings again. Yeah, so during this presentation, I will convince you that this is possible to not have bigos in the cloud. Uh, I am Camille, I'm working in Azure cluster. This year I will be 32 years old. Uh, having my consultant journey for like two, three years, I believe engage in some community activities like blogging and public speaking. Uh, I love sport and good food, but you already know that. Uh, you can find me uh, on my blog. I don't believe it's worth to, uh, to, to try it right now, but later you will, you will find me. I'm also a beginner speaker, so please forgive me my mistakes during this presentation. I have two goals, as I uh, mentioned at the beginning. So the first one is I want to convince you that it is possible to leave proper level of autonomy to teams so they can be productive in the public cloud. They can, uh, they can make uh, improvements in their workloads. They can uh, make our uh, customer relationship better and we can make them happy by doing that. So this is how your developers could work, could, could look if you, if you implement my advices from, uh, from today's session. At the same time, uh, happy developers doesn't mean that you are not secured, not well organized, and you are not cost optimized. So still, we can provide all these three uh, requirements, security, 
uh, operation efficiency and cost optimization at the same moment. So, yep. Yeah. So this will be your operations, finance, and security guys happy about uh, the environment. But you know, uh, I hope because will not be your first uh, thing. You, you, first thing you think about when you see your environment. We always start in a blank plate. So public cloud brings us new opportunities. So we can be faster on market. We can use pre-built blocks to build our custom solution. But at the same moment, public cloud brings some threats. And talking about the balance between them, uh, we, will, we will talk about the balance between them today. Uh, that's by the way, thing I'm doing on my daily basic by providing assessments and discovery phases for customers, even from Fortune 500. Uh, but I will give you some sneaky peek to, to the recommendations we give to our customers. So first of all, uh, cloud for developers, that it's a synonym of having a self-service finally not being dependent that much on infrastructure guys, having some elasticity and being able to use blocks, uh, building blocks to build something bigger. Let's name this thing workload. Yeah, so you as a team, you work on a workload, service, application, whatever you name it. And to provide some uh, common understanding what it is, let's, let's say that this is a synonym of, of a house. So one application is a house. To build the house application or house in the cloud, you need to have a, a place to do it. So you need a kind of your dedicated property where you're not disrupted by, by neighbors, where there is a boundary that no, nobody without your uh, allowance can enter. So that's a logical space you need uh, to create a house in the real life or a workload in, in the cloud. So once you have the property, uh, you can start with some architecture decisions and hopefully after, uh, after some time you're able to for implementation and later for, for the maintenance. But as you probably know from your uh, cloud experience, from your professional experience, that things not only go uh, that smooth. So it could happen that the feature uh, you want to implement in your application will not be what customer expect. For instance, you have the web application, you decide to provide a chatbot. Uh, that's very simple in cloud. So you just buy, you can create a POC in let's say one sprint and through sprints later, you know if this feature uh, meets customer requirements or not. So then you just wait, waste to one sprint. So that, that's the case, yeah? Uh, you think you have a hypothesis that something will make uh, your relationship with customer better because of you uh, of being in the cloud, you can test that, uh, that idea very fast. And in case you are not, uh, you are wrong, that's it. Yeah? You, you remove the feature, you, you roll back, you proceed with next ideas. But from time to time, your mistakes can lead to something much more important and it will be a security threat. So in that case, you risk loss of the reputation on the market. So you can, uh, you can lose customers as an effect of your security mistakes. What else can go wrong? Uh, you can waste money on stupid things and as a result, you might not deliver what was promised. That's another risk. So wasting money, uh, delivering something that cannot be used by customer. And as a result, it can, you can run out of your budget. Uh, I really like to focus on the security aspects because I believe this is the most important thing. Whenever we, uh, we are questioning, can we leave the developer team alone in the cloud so they can configure, configure everything on their own? That's the security is first thing we, we probably will think about. Uh, but not only uh, it's not only us thinking about security threats in the cloud. We have whole cybercrime business thinking about exactly the same. As in each business, they must be profitable. So it means that they need to create a revenue. Uh, their goal is to hack systems, steal data, compromise organizations, just because they expect to gain some profits. For example, money. Uh, and 
believe me or not, but 12 years ago, it was possible to randomly scan whole internet for open RDP connections, uh, trying to log in with some very simple uh, username and password like admin admin or admin password one two three uh, or something. Then there was a pre-built tool so you can check if this machine is actually ATM. And uh, there were hackers uh, that really used this method and uh, stole a lot of credit cards uh, this way. So, you know, it's always the matter of price. So if you're if your bank account uh, would be like worth to hack, someone will spend enough money to do it. But global, let's say, uh, cybercrime business focus on things that, things that are misconfigured. They follow Pareto rule. Pareto rule is about like 20% of your effort will give you 80% of the results. So it means that they are looking for things that are easy to discover, that are not configured properly, that can bring them quick effect to compromise you. Let me give you an, one, another example uh, using some numbers. Uh, I believe it was last year, one of the Polish companies securing, they create a tool uh, in Python uh, to scan AWS buckets. They perform a scan, like first of all, they discover uh, the bucket names based on DNS and few other methods they discover 60,000 of buckets. 10,000 of them uh, were readable. So it means they were able to download even some DB backups from this S3 buckets. And to 2,000 of them, which is about like three and a half percent, it was possible to write a file there. What's more, uh, in these buckets that are open to external world we, and allowing to write a file there, there were, or they, there were already files like close this bucket, please. So people were informing uh, the owners of the bucket that this is the right moment to close it. So as a security engineer, you face few things. First of all, you need to prove that you're secure. Uh, you remember the analogy between the workload and the house and that's the challenge actually, yeah? So each house is different and you cannot be uh, a blocker for your developers, for productivity, for bringing new values to business. At the same moment, security or any operations team is responsible for evangelizing about good practices. Um, but to be honest, people don't care. Yeah, their goal is to deliver the values to their stakeholders rather than focus on security and operations aspects. So for the security team, it's even more challenging because, you know, there are a lot of houses, each of them is different. Uh, you need to provide some best practices and ensure they are in place uh, at the, considering this whole picture, each individual workload. So that's definitely a challenge. And we will, I will tell you today how to solve it. So at the beginning, you might feel a little bit blind, but Let's let's move back to our childhood and let's try to dream how the best solution for that would look like. How would the holy grail look like? So let's let's say that here are our properties. You remember the place where you can build a house. Uh, one per workload per environment, let's say. But to simplify, each of the square here is a is a property for a flat for a house in uh, in Azure a place to for your workload. Each of the workloads is different, so as you can see, each of the houses is different. And it would be perfect if some global team could look at it, create a list of requirements, policies, maybe how many, how high the building could be, yeah. And it would be perfect to enforce that at scale, so each of our houses is covered by, uh, by those rules and those rules are enforced. We want also to have the opportunity to see the overall compliance of our uh, environment, yeah? So if all workloads follow all rules that the central team designed. Uh, what's more, what about the future uh, workloads that someone will create in the future, yeah? We also want that whatever someone will try to create in the future, it will also be covered with all our uh, policies and the best practices. So that's a holy grail. 
And actually, this is policy-driven governance, which is the subject of our today discussion. Governance. I will make uh, one step back to tell you what governance actually is. So this is a process, like never ending one, that your organization will, uh, will do forever if you will stay in the cloud. And this is all about keeping proper balance between being effective and taking advantage of all cloud opportunities, but at the same time being aligned with all good practices, security, finance, and others. So on the one hand, you have uh, risks. On the other hand, you have opportunities and you need some, you try to somehow uh, keep the balance between them. So the business is satisfied and you don't risk that you, your organization will compromise. Uh, as I promised, uh, just because I'm doing this kind of assessments uh, quite often, I will give you one uh, example from the real life. Uh, after two weeks assessments, we discovered, let's say 60, uh, 60 things we will uh, we recommend customer to do. Uh, there are some very simple stuff like, guys, please start uh, doing backups in your production environment, yeah? Super simple. Uh, other ones like, guys, uh, we highly recommend you to start monitoring your production environment. And, but there are, um, there are also some much, much deeper recommendation, but I would like to use something quite simple for all of us. So we assess customer environment and we saw that like after our hands-on assessment and having meetings with all stakeholders in the organization, we figured out that they don't monitor costs at all. So they have a Power BI report, and once a day, once today, once every two day, uh, two days, the dedicated person checks it. And if he saw some anomalies, uh, this person is going to inform the stakeholder. Hi, your uh, your spending grow significantly since yesterday. Maybe you should have a look for that. Have a look on that. So uh, that's the case. Eh? It was manual, and our recommendation was, guys. The risk is that you don't control your budget at all and you can be uh, out of, of the budget. Uh, you should automate creating the ticket whenever you, you see that the budget was already overspent, but not only. Uh, there are some capabilities that allow you to uh, check what is the forecasted budget for following um, month and based on that, create an alert. So you can uh, be aware that you will be out of budget even at the third day of the month, yeah, based on the forecast. Uh, we try to provide them some high level uh, overview how it should look like. So in that case, you need to think where you want to set the budget. So it can be whole Azure, it can be each business unit, it can be environment-based budget, it can be particular workload budget. Uh, you can, of course, combine them, but for each of them, you define who is the stakeholder and what is the amount of money you can spend. Based on that, you monitor it. So if the current spend is one uh, is um, already hitting the 100% threshold or the forecast is like, okay, this month we'll spend more than we predict, then we create a threshold alert and by some basic integration with ServiceNow, what was the customer ITSM tool, we inform stakeholders responsible for this budget scope that uh, they are out of money or they will be out of money. So that's a kind of recommendation from the assessment. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. The first thing, if we want to control it globally and we want to enforce some good practices across our whole environment is how we organize resources in our cloud. We all know that to efficient manage, uh, for efficient people managing, we have the organization structure inside our organization. Yeah? So we group people that do similar things. We put them under the same manager so the manager can uh, manage them uh, effectively. And things are no different in the cloud. So uh, in Azure, here you have our holy gray process, process on the right. And I will right now replace each of the pieces with Azure service. So uh, at the bottom, we have our houses. Uh, so actually there are resource groups where you have all resources related for your workloads, like storage account, web apps, 
uh, some storage, some uh, persistence like databases, queues and whatever magic from the cloud you, you want. Uh, but as we mentioned, yeah, you have your building blocks and uh, you build your workload, your house based on them. Uh, in case of Azure, your property, let's say where you build a house can be a resource group, but in some cases in the enterprise scale, it can be also a subscription. So this is the house level. Now we have uh, the level of all the houses in our, uh, in our organization. So I mean, all workloads. So to effectively manage things at scale, we use management groups. It means that whatever you apply at the management group, it can be policy or some role assignments, I mean permissions, they will be inherited down through the hierarchy. That's very important, yeah, because you want to assign things once and cover everything what is your environment and everything what will be created in the future in your environment. You can also make nestings in the management groups depending on the requirements, but to keep it super simple, I will leave it like this. So here is, uh, here is our hierarchy. At the top, we have the team. The team is creating policies. These policies will be assigned at the management group. So all our workloads will be covered with these uh, policies. Before we jump to policies, I will show you uh, some good practices about managing the resource hierarchy. So that's the first demo. Uh, this will be live. So if something will run, sorry for will not work. Uh, sorry for that. Demo gods are waiting for me. So let let's give let's give them uh, an opportunity to. Okay, I need to ring annotation. Ring off. Okay, right. I should be able. So that's my. Uh, Azure portal, let me go to the main page. And here I have management group hierarchy. Kind of simple one. Uh, I have the root management group, which is built in. You cannot uh, play with that. You can just try to rename it. Then I have my production management group and whatever subscription and resource group will be created under this management group, it will be covered with all identity and access management uh, stuff and all policies that will apply at this level. What I really, really like is to have development management group that will contain all subscriptions and resource group uh, dedicated for development under the production one. Uh, that's a kind of trick. Uh, people usually tend to have them uh, at the same level. So you have production and at the level of production, as I have sandbox, someone can have development. but I believe the best practice is to have development under production. So all settings, all policies or uh, assignments uh, will be inherited from production. And in development, you will have exactly the same rules as in production, yeah? That's a goal, yeah? I want to have production-like environment everywhere. If I want to test something completely that is not aligned with our policies, I have sandbox for that, yeah? So on sandbox, I have different policies. All good practices are applied on production. They are inherited in the development environment, so they are aligned. Uh, but I separate development uh, resources, subscriptions resource group, just because on the development management group, I will apply some policies related for cost savings. So all security things on production inherited down through the hierarchy to the development environment, but at the development environment uh, level, I will, uh, take care about cost optimization. So for example, uh, let me give you a practical example on production. Let's say we will uh, we'll enforce that all storage accounts must be, uh, must use private service endpoints for the virtual network subnet. So they are not available out of the internet and from the public internet. So that's the security rule at the production level, but at the development level, I will reduce the uh, SKUs for storage accounts to make them cheaper. We will not allow, for example, for geo-replication for them, yeah, to save money. I, I think you get the idea. Uh, let me go maybe to one of the management groups just to show you that the inheritance works. So if I go to access, uh, access control identity and access management, I can see that in a role assignments, uh, things are inherited from the top of the hierarchy. So here, for example, we have uh, assignment for this managed service identity that is inherited from the root management group. 
Uh, so, uh, so we, this identity will have permissions in our management groups, all subscriptions and all uh, research group behind behind in the hierarchy. Same goes for policy. So all, po all policies applied at the higher level. And what is policy? We will speak uh, about that in a moment. Uh, all policies that were enforced at the whole organizational level, they are applied also at the level of development management group. So that's the resource hierarchy. Very, very important, very simple, uh, but at the same time, very powerful. So if you organize it properly, then uh, it won't be a big loss in the future to, ma for, to manage that. Okay, uh, let me just remove annotations at all. <laughs> clear okay disable annotations uh, i'm back so that was the first uh, first thing research hierarchy very important the second thing is our azure policies i will tell you in a moment how they work and they are actually the crucial part of uh, of everything and i will in a moment tell you as well uh, what is the relationship between the research hierarchy, policies, and the holy grail process we designed at the beginning? But let's start with Azure policy. There are two main components, uh, ARM, in a moment I will describe what it is, and attributes of the resource that you want to create. So no matter how, CLI, portal, PowerShell, Bicep, ARM template, whatever Terraform, yeah, whatever the way is, when you want to create or update a resource, you always need to talk to Azure Resource Manager. That's a central component of Azure. Uh, all uh, requests are processed by, by this component. And this component is responsible for contacting proper underlying resource providers to create your resource. So you create a request, no matter how, then Azure Resource Manager knows which providers to contact, compute network storage, whatever else. And, uh, and that's it, yeah. Of course, once you try to create a resource, you provide some attribute values for it, depending on what the resource is. So for example, for a storage account, you decide about access to the storage account, if it's public or not. That's an attribute of the storage account request. And here is a place for Azure policy. So using Azure policy, at the level of resource manager validating the request, you can make some additional validation. So you can check uh, what are the attributes of the resource and depending of their values, you can do something. So you have a condition that is built based on how the resource is configured, how the request looks like, what are the attributes uh, describing that resource, what are the values, and based on conditions built on, on this, you can decide what to do. So let me give you a more practical example of denying a request. So someone, I mean, identity, whatever, user, uh, service principle, managed service identity, user assigned managed identity, uh, identity in Azure AD try to, is trying to create a storage account. Of course, to, to create that, it's required to provide some attributes. One of the attributes is name, for example, yeah? So Azure policy is a perfect service if you want to enforce naming standard across your entire environment, and it will help you with operations. So if someone goes to a resource, he, he, will, he or she will, uh, from the very beginning, know, for example, what is the name of the workload? Or based on tagging that are enforced by Azure policy, uh, this person will know who's responsible for that workload. So you check the attributes. For example, you check whether someone wants to expose this storage account over HTTP or HTTPS. And you build a condition that could be more or less this way. If it's HTTP, then I will deny this request. So it will work this way. Now I want to tell you what is the uh, where is the, what is the place for Azure policy in our holy grail design? So here is the Azure uh, policy. Uh, you remember the rules created by central team where they describe how the houses, how big they can be and how to secure them, what, what kind of locks, locks should be used and so on and so forth. Uh, so 
these rules will be actually Azure policy definitions that are assigned at the management group level. So I will show you definition and assignment in a moment during the demo. And what would be very important for us to have the understanding of how compliant are we at the moment. So first of all, policies assigned at the management group level, uh, they will enforce whatever you would like to have. So you will create uh, some logics based on resource that is being created attributes. And based on this logic, you will decide what to do with the, with the request. You, you, you can think about it like a way to enforce whatever your best practices are, no matter if they are related to security, if they are related to um, operations efficiency, cost optim and, and so on and so forth, whatever you want. So based on attributes of the object you want to create, of the resource you want to create, you create a condition and you decide whether this resource can be created or not. But that's not all uh, things that Azure Policy can do for you. Wait, wait a minute, please. So I will show you a policy in a moment. Uh, there are a few things that describe single policy. That's the, like the name, mode, some metadata, but what is the most important for us is of course the rule. So let me jump in and show you some definitions. Again, demo. So uh, going back to the uh, main pane of Azure portal, Second, annotate off. Okay, so I go again here, home. And here we have the dedicated plane for Azure policy. And as you can see, you can define the definitions of the policies and assign them at the different levels of, uh, of your resource hierarchy. And of course, this is why we have the management group hierarchy because we want to assign these policies in one place, so they are inherited down for the hierarchy. So let me go to the uh, tenant group management, tenant root management group, and see what we have here. First of all, as you can see, we have the compliance report. So we know how compliant we are. Based on the currently assigned policies, I can check whether particular, like how are we compliant? against the uh, the policies that were assigned. So for example, here, here, I want to collect all diagnostic setting logs from the key vault. So for example, who and when access the secret. And I want to stream them to a central log analytics place where our security team using maybe Sentinel can analyze them and react in case of detecting some, some anomalies. Or maybe uh, I have the regulatory requirements. So I need to keep these logs for like two years, for example. So I see that two out of three key vaults in my environment, they are aligned with this policy, but one of them is not. So that's the first thing. Uh, definitions, let me go there. So here we have a definitions. And there are a lot of them. Uh, of course, you can build your own if you need. Uh, there are different categories. So let me, for example, jump in, deselect everything. And there are even policies for Kubernetes cluster. Maybe something re related a little bit to the uh, security, uh, security. So let me quickly find something. Yeah, so for example, Kubernetes cluster should be accessible only over HTTPS. So if I check this policy, uh, I can see how this condition uh, is built. And it can be like Kubernetes is kind of special, so we'll move in the moment to something more simple. But as you can see, here is the big condition. And based on this condition, we uh, take an effect. And this effect can be, for example, denying uh, creation. Let me find something uh, maybe a little bit easier. So I will go back to the definitions. Let me find something related to storage accounts. Okay. Uh, storage account should restrict network access let's let's try to check uh, this one 
So as you can see, here is this entire policy uh, definition. It has some, some properties like display name, uh, policy type, description, uh, some metadata like version and category. But what is important for us, the policy can take parameters. So uh, for example, uh, you can create a policy that will not, that will disable creation of all resources that are not in the region of your choice. So as a parameter to this policy assignment, you will take the list of allowed regions. So that's why we have parameters. So you can create a definition that is generic enough so you can reuse it depending on the context. Next, we have our policy rule. Let me go there. So that's simply two parts, like in any programming language, yeah, or a scripting language. You have this statement, the condition, and then you have the uh, effect. So in that case, if the resource that is currently evaluated against this policy, if the type of the resource is storage account, and uh, the, this particular attribute of this uh, of this resource is not equal to den then deny, so default action for network echoes is not deny, then we will uh, do something. And what we will do is parameterize in that case. So we can just have an alert about that, or we can deny all those requests. So that's how the uh, structure looks like. That's only a definition to have that implemented in the environment, you need to create an assignment. And we will complete this process of creating custom policy, assigning it and evaluating if it works in the moment. Uh, yep. So going one step back, you can not only deny uh, requests, let me go back to the presentation, but you can also uh, take an action. So you check what are the attributes and then based on that, you decide that you need to slightly modify the request, for example. So you can use then a modify effect. You have also very interesting effect deploy if not exist. So for example, you create, someone creates a virtual machine. You check if this person uh, adds that virtual machine to a backup. And if not, then Azure policy will do it automatically. Yeah, so another very, very good example, how you can use Azure policy to ensure that your environment is compliant. So you decide you need to uh, cover all virtual machines and Azure SQL DBs with uh, recovery service vault backup. You can enforce that using Azure policy. Let me give you an example. So uh, in case you, you, you already know the deny effect, so that's, uh, that's kind of uh, simple. Uh, and we will have an example of that in a moment. So for example, you check the name of the resource and if the name is not uh, aligned with your naming, pool, naming standard, then you deny creating of the resource and you avoid MS in your environment. Demo will be in a moment. Uh, one another example is modifying the request on the fly. So someone creates, uh, wants, to create, uh, wants to create a resource, defined how it should look like, uh, decided to have HTTP as a protocol for storage account, but on the fly, Azure policy will change the protocol to HTTPS and allow creation of this resource. So even if you're trying by uh, on purpose or by accident to create resource that is not aligned with company policies, Azure policy can help you with that. Just by modifying the resource on the fly. And an example I show you, uh, I mentioned before, Someone is creating the virtual machine, forgot to add it to backup. The backup uh, enrollment is not a part of the request, but in an automated way, use Azure policy to uh, additionally deploy backup enrollment. Okay, that's a good time to have another uh, demo. And in that case, we will address a real world issue that happened, I believe, last year. Let me jump in. So uh, here is the chaos DB. That was a vulnerability discovered by, I don't know who, <laughs> to be honest, but it allows you to 
get the primary access keys to Cosmos DB and do whatever you want with the data uh, inside this DB. Yeah, so you can create collections, remove something, the, like whatever, yeah, read it. Uh, that was the vulnerability. And we need all to be aware that we cannot fully rely on the vendor, uh, that the vendor will create perfect solution for us. That's a very good example, yeah? We trust the vendor, whatever it is, Google, AWS or something. Uh, we believe they do, they put enough, enough effort to make it secure, but things like Chaos DB will happen in the future. And what was the attack vector for this, for this vulnerability? So Chaos DB by default is when you create it, that's exposed directly to the internet. You get the DNS name and Actually, if you don't protect it properly, uh, this is accessible all around the world. Of course, you need the ski, but it was possible to get the ski because of the vulnerability. So if you are not limiting the network access in that case, you are vulnerable and someone can stall your data. And minimizing the vector at attack is one of the roles of security teams in the cloud. So we will address this issue in a moment. Okay, so let's go. Uh, I will open again my portal. Let's go to home. I will go to Azure policy. And whenever you want to, so our goal will be to enforce in our whole environment that all Cosmos DB uh, accounts, Cosmos DB databases, they will not be exposed directly to the internet. They will be accessible only from uh, from our virtual networks. So in case of this chaos DB vulnerability, someone can attack our DBs, but only from our internal network. That's a kind of a limitation of, for the vector. I always recommend you to first try to find a built-in policy developed by Microsoft that, that is actually implementing what you want or is quite close to implement what you want. So then you can slightly adjust it, assign, and you have, uh, that's a quick win, yeah? And again, the Pareto rule. So let me, let me find what uh, Microsoft prepare for Cosmos DB. Cosmos DB. Okay, I will look only for built-in policies. Category, okay, type built-in, sure. And here are like allowed locations, throughput for cost savings and so on and so forth. But what we are really uh, looking for is that Cosmos DB accounts should use private link. Uh, it will really help us, <coughs> sorry, uh, we've handled this vulnerability uh, of Chaos DB. Let's look inside what is there and here is the condition. So they check if it's like the resource that someone wants to create is, uh, is uh, Cosmos DB. And then if the private endpoint connection uh, is created, if not, then they parameterize the effect. So they can, this built-in policy only allows you to get the compliance, let's say data, from your environment, but will not allow you to deny this request. So what we will do, we will create almost the same policy, but we will deny request if they not, deny Cosmos DB creation request if they don't enable private networking. So duplicate definition, that's the first thing we will do. And then we decide where, where the this definition will be created. And it makes sense to create the definition as at the higher possible scope just because then it can be used uh, in the lower levels of our uh, of our environment. So we'll create the tenant root. Uh, we will name it soft serve Cosmos DB. Soft serve Cosmos DB accounts should use private links. Uh, we will create them under the same category, but we will now modify the rule. Uh, one thing to add, that's kind of like a simple rule. Uh, you can use, to build this rule, you can use, uh, you can use all ARM template functions. So you can build even more complex 
more complex uh, conditions there based on whatever you need. And those conditions can be very, very complex. I can show you an example uh, you will find on my GitHub. And this is a policy validating naming standard for resource group, all aligned with what Microsoft suggests you to do. So that's the way to validate uh, name of the resource group, for example. Going back to our Cosmos DB case, what do we need to check? Uh, we actually want to just have deny here, or maybe we'll do it differently. Uh, we will add one more uh, allowed effect for that. So here I will add deny. So right now someone can use the deny effect, not only audit, uh, and the default value will be deny. So that's our super development to to handle chaos DB vulnerability. Let me check if all other things were, yeah, we'll use super soft serve chaos DB mitigation. Okay, so let's create that. Yeah, I know uh, showing the code on the live session is not uh, that sexy, but it was pretty simple. So I believe uh, you can handle it. So the definition is created, but that's only the definitions. Yeah, for guys that have experience with group policy from Active Directory, that's just a GPO. Yeah, still you need to uh, apply this GPO on, on the scope uh, that you want. And we'll do that in a moment. So. From the portal, I will click, here is my uh, custom policy we have just created, and I will assign it to uh, the tenant root uh, group. Uh, you can provide some exclusions. So for example, uh, you know, once you apply the policy that will deny something, then whenever the resource is not compliant with your requirements, it, it won't be possible to successfully update this resource, yeah? That's, that's the expected effect. So. For example, uh, if you have resources that are already in your environment and you know that they are not aligned with the new policy you will assign, then you can temporarily create an uh, exceptions for them uh, and later think what to do. Yeah, it's like for, in some cases there are like, you, you can do three things to make your uh, resource compliant. Modify it to be aligned with your requirements. Uh, Create an exemption, but that's uh, you will let's say give a time for the team to handle, like to decide what to do with the resource. But in some cases, once you uh, set something at the beginning, it won't be possible anymore to modify it. So, like a name, yeah, you cannot rename a resource in Azure. So, in that case, if you want to become, uh, let's say, uh, compliant with all the requirements, then you will need to recreate those resource simply. We don't want to have any exclusions. Uh, assignment name can be like that. Uh, that's the kind of trick I will share with you because people I see, they create policies with audit effect and then separate policies and assignments for deny effect. They, they don't want to start with deny just because they are uh, they're scared what will happen with the resources that are not compliant. As I, as I told you, it won't be possible anymore to modify them once you apply the DNA policy. Uh, resources that are not compliant uh, will not be modified. Uh, you won't be able to modify them uh, if you don't modify them in the way that they became uh, compliant. So, but the trick is that if you assign the policy that has a DNA effect and you just want to get an overview of the compliance status across your whole environment, then you can pol disable policy enforcement. That's like the awesome thing and the trick I really, really recommend you to do. So you create the policy that denies something, but you assign it without enforcement. And it will allow you to get an overview of, of, the, of the compliance status in your environment without affecting resources that are not compliant right now. So that's the recommended flow. Uh, next, no parameters. We will use the default value of deny. We, we we set in the policy, uh, no remediation at the moment. But the remediation is very very uh, nice thing. Yeah. So, in some cases, 
you will have the policy that will modify something, yeah? Maybe add a tag value, or maybe just modify one of the attribute that is possible without creating a resource. Maybe in the case you, uh, I showed you before uh, that we had, we have key vaults and those key vaults, there are not all of them forward logs to log analytics. So in that case, we can run, create a policy that will enable logging on the key vaults and then run the remediation action. So all key vaults that were created before we uh, create the policy and the resources that I created before the policy that are not aligned with the policy, we can run the remediation and make them align with our best practices, with our policies. So, and this will be our last demo for today. Okay, we have half an hour more, so let's go. Next. Uh, do not expose us to Hayos DB. Vulnerability. Next, review and create. Okay, so we have our uh, assignment. Uh, this policy is, is, is assigned at the top level. So we can right now try to create a Cosmos DBA account in whatever place and ensure that our policy is working. So let's try to do it. Um, subscriptions, um, Visual Studio might be a right one. Let me create a resource. Cosmos DB, of course. I, I, I love the capability of voting for the built-in services in Azure. As we can see, the Cosmos DB is not, uh, has not the perfect uh, opinions right now. If it would be a place that you consider as a place to go and eat something, you would probably skip it. Uh, but let's proceed. Core SQL might be fine for us. A resource group. Do we have something there? RG. Oh, let's pick this one. Uh, account name, soft serve, maybe so see demo policy region. And you see, whatever you select there, there in any other place, you always actually uh, under the hood, you are changing the attributes of the resource of the resource create uh, request. Yeah. And based on all the things that you said there, uh, you can create the policy that will check those attributes and then do something. That's like the really, really uh, power of that service. Uh, free tire, yeah, let's skip it right now. Geo redundancy, I don't care, but again, yeah. For example, you can check when, if the resource is created in the production environment and then enable geo redundancy requirement. So in that case, this condition will look more or less this way. First of all, you should uh, create tags on the resources. So if the tag environment value is production, then geo redundancy for Cosmos DB should be enabled. Otherwise, we, we uh, deny the request. Or maybe you can use modify effect. So in the, if the Cosmos DB account is created in the production environment, then you use the modify effect and you by default enable geo redundancy. That's the trick, yeah? Not only enforcing security things, but also best practices, company standards, uh, providing reliability and resiliency and so on and so forth. Now networking, that's, we created the policy that will deny any other uh, configuration than this. So private link should be enabled, but we want to test that uh, it will deny our request. So we will create the Cosmos DB and expose it by default to the public internet. So of course, credentials are needed to access it, but still at the networking level, this Cosmos DB is exposed. Backup policy still, again, yeah, you, you can have some best practices enforced by Azure policy. So right now you can consider me as a member of the team in the cloud, uh, trying to use my autonomy to creating a resource. 
but I won't be able to bypass the policies that were set by a security and compliance team at the beginning. Encryption, tags, review and create, and hopefully it won't be possible. <laughs> Validation is success, but let's try to create this resource. Um, okay, I know I showed you that uh, it will be possible to to change the assignment type. That was probably the bad thing I did. Give me just a second. Uh, yeah, that's that's how live demos usually work. Soft serve Cosmos DB quickly. Let's try to find this assignment. Uh, edit assignment. Hopefully. Yeah, policy enforcement is uh, disabled, but that's like a good uh, example that you can disable the enforcement and then the deny uh, won't take place, but you will be able to see the, uh, the overall compliance report. Let me change that and let me quickly try to create one more Cosmos DB uh, wrongly configured. So that will be uh, quicker. I will not talk, I will just click Cosmos DB create. And you see that like right now, after just check, switching the one checkbox and enforce the DNA assignment, I'm not able to create that resource anymore. Yeah, if I create during the validation, uh, I get the message, do not expose us to chaos DB vulnerability. That's how you can enforce at the uh, very high level, uh, all the standards requirements. So. Once they all are enforced, you can provide some autonomy to the teams. Let me go back to presentation. You see that not, that's not possible. Even going to the raw error, you will see exactly which attribute based on exactly what condition uh, was the reason that we denied this request. Let me go back to the presentation. Okay, uh, exclusion exemptions. Uh, so as I told you, you have the exclusions. So if you want to, for example, create a policy out there, but skip validation in one of the resource group, then you can use exclusions. If you want to, and but they won't be included in the, top, in the uh, compliance report. So for example, if you have 40 resources in those four resource group, 10 here, 10 here, 10 here, and 10 here, if you skip or exclude one of the resource groups, then only the 30 uh, resources will be uh, counted in the compliance report. Yeah, so you, 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 you can this way forget that something is not compliant. Yeah, just because it won't show up in the report. You have another concept that is exemption and in exemption, uh, those resources will be all counted, but the resources that are uh, that you create exemption for, uh, you will know that they are temporarily uncompliant, but you plan to do something with them. Uh, one more concept is remediation, where the resources that were created before the policy was, was created. Uh, so for example, you have a key vault, they don't, uh, and you don't in you have key vaults in the environment where logging is not enabled. Then you create a policy that will automatically enable logging for all key vaults. So all next key vaults from the from this moment of time will be covered with logging. But you still need to deal with the key vaults that were created before you created the policy, and that's where remediation can be very useful. Using remediation, you can run the policy against current resources that were created before the policy was uh, developed, assigned and so on. And you can remedy current resources so they became, become compliant. I will try to show you that in the demo. Uh, so let me quickly check what we have in our environment. 
that will be our last uh, demo. So here we have the deny effect. Let me go to the policy. Uh, deploy diagnostic settings. Okay, that's perfect. So now uh, it figures out that I have in my environment three key vaults. Only one of them has logging enabled. So let's try to fix it. Uh, let's go to remediation. Uh, I see the uh, policies where I can do some remediation. Let me get there. So that's a new remediation task. Uh, I will pick up one of my uh, key vaults. Okay, so just to show you that uh, logging is not enabled. So that's a KV SecOps one, diagnostic settings. And you see that we don't collect the logs. So let me go back and back and try to remediate it. Reevaluate not. Okay, but click here, remediate. And for all the key vaults that are not aligned with the policy that are right now not compliant, this action will be uh, triggered. So hopefully uh, it will be successful. So remediation status is accepted. Uh, refresh. Okay, and as you can see, uh, this resource is remediated. And in the moment, I will also show you how under the hood it works. So first of all, let's go back and see what the policy is doing. Yeah, so going to policy, uh, here we have the name of the uh, definition. So deploy diagnostic settings for key vault to log analytics workspace. So let me find this definition. Deploy, deploy log. And all categories deploy maybe, maybe this way monitoring. Okay, monitoring chosen and key vault. Deploy diagnostic settings for key vault. It looks like this is the policy we, we have uh, already implemented and assigned in our environment. And as you can see, uh, here we have some parameters. So that's, that's pretty obvious, yeah? To which log analytics do you want to stream those logs? That's a parameter, yeah? Uh, then, few other parameters, but they are not that important. The destination is the probably most important one. And here is how we check the key vault. So first of all, uh, we check uh, whether uh, the diagnostic settings logs are enabled. Yeah, uh, we check if metrics are enabled as well, just because this policy is pretty generic, allows you to uh, collect logs and metrics to the logs analytics. We are only interested in logs. And then uh, if the logs are not enabled, it will perform deployment of Azure Resource Manager template to that resource. So in case you are, logs are not enabled, then what do we do? We deploy something more, uh, another resource in, in that case. So here is the template that will be uh, deployed. And of course, this is again, parameterized with the parameters from policy. So if you don't collect logs, then this ARM template will be deployed and it will enable uh, logging logs collection. Okay, so let me go back to our remediation action. Here is the policy. Okay, uh, okay, that's another uh, remediation. So remediation, remediation task. Oh, they failed. So I won't be able to show you that it's really uh, working probably, but I will show you how it tries to do it. Maybe there is some permissions issue or something or missing log analytics or whatever, yeah? So I will go to the key vault. 
then I will go to the Key Vault resource group and I will check history of ARM template deployments under the scope. So here you see that what actually policy tried to do was to deploy this ARM template. We can check what it, what it is and what was the issue. So in that case, operation name failed, resource not found. Yeah, so as you can see, the log analytic workspace doesn't exist. So I provide the wrong log analytic workspace. Uh, how much time do we have? Uh, will be three minutes to fix that quickly. Let's try. Oh no, uh, I will skip it. So just because creating the log analytics will take some time, then we need to update the policy. And then we need to, first of all, evaluate the environment and then create remediation. So it will be additional effort. And I'm uh, aware that you won't be able to ask me any questions if we start doing that. So maybe uh, not, not perfect demo, but you can see that the only issue here is that we don't have this log analytics. Otherwise it would create this, uh, this, uh, this it, it will enable the logs. So give me just a second. Maybe I can show you how it uh, was deployed in the past. So here is the successful deployment from the past. And if we go to one of the key vault that is compliant, for example, to key vault SecOps 2, this one. So after the remediation, what would happen uh, that in the diagnostic settings, they will be enabled. Uh, this name of this uh, diagnostic settings resource is set by policy log analytics. And if we go there, we would see that uh, logs are enabled and they are streamed to the log analytics workspace. I, I removed the other one, I think, uh, for the cost optimization purpose. So the assignment is wrong, but you can see that it would look uh, more or less this way. Okay, so uh, I think we are almost about uh, to finish. So let me go back to the presentation. So I would like uh, to summarize and give you some main takeaways from this presentation that first of all, policy-driven governance is road. Uh, it's a path, it's a process. So it's not the thing that like do you do it once and you can forget about it. You need to take care about that forever, yeah? As long as you are in the cloud. Uh, next, the providing the autonomy for teams in the public cloud is challenging, but doable. And at the end of the day, you can uh, let them be productive, let them implement business feature as fast as possible. And at the same moment, be secured, well-organized and optimized uh, like by some best cost optimization practices. So summarizing, uh, you start with the blank plate and there is a way to not end up uh, having a BIGOS in your environment. So I wish all of you having BIGOS only on a plate and never in the Azure environment. Thank you guys. That's a good time to start asking questions. I'm more than eager to, uh, to answer them. And later you can of course ping me on, on Teams on whatever, if you come up with some questions or if, if you face some issues uh, related to governance or uh, policies in Azure.